This is a trigger warning. The podcast you are about to listen to contains references to rape and sexual violence towards women throughout the history of art. Listener discretion is advised. If you are listening to this podcast aloud and there are young children present, it would be best to use your headphones. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical with me, your host and resident art historian, Joe McLaughlin. Welcome back. It's episode 46 and on today's podcast, I'm joined by the brilliant Melody Thornton, who is an artist based in the UK. Melody joins me on the podcast today to talk about probably one of the most sensitive potentially controversial subjects that I've ever discussed on the podcast but it's very important that we do and that is the representation of rape and sexual assault within art history. What I find very interesting discussing this with Melody is she is so passionate about educating people that these acts have always been depicted, have always been affecting women and men and within art history your titles and how it's depicted completely hides, justifies, camouflages, misleads its viewer. For me, this podcast has left me asking a lot of questions and it's a very important conversation. So if you feel that you'll be uncomfortable listening to this, please feel free to skip over. But Melody brilliantly talks us through five works from within the history of art that are incredibly important, that are cornerstones within the history of art itself, that students across the world, art history students will know to look at and potentially don't know the secret of what they're looking at or what is actually being depicted. Almost hidden in plain sight, Melody talks us through five works, why it's important to look again at these titles, what mythology can really teach us and why art history should stop downplaying the act of rape and sexual violence. This is a really interesting conversation. It's not meant to upset anybody. And it's important that I'm an art historian that I, and I want to talk about all the things that affect the world. Because sexual violence is nothing new, unfortunately. And I feel there's been exhibitions about this. There have been essays written about these sorts of paintings. I want to have this conversation. And it's important that you do have these conversations. Particularly if they are uncomfortable ones to have. I think that's where you learn the most about yourself. And Melody is just so knowledgeable. And it's a really interesting episode and another way to look at art history and history in general and how stories are told. You will absolutely learn something from listening to this episode. So please do enjoy the episode as Melody and I discuss the unheroic act representation of rape and sexual violence within our history. What far spiked your interest, shall we say, in realising that there is a huge misrepresentation within paintings and stories and how they're depicted within art? I mistakenly thought Judith beheading Holofenes was a was a Caravaggio painting yeah. and I had the postcard I had it on my wall and, and all that and then I found out that actually it was by a different artist which I was surprised at because it, it it's got all you know the trimmings of a Caravaggio it's got yeah. the, you know the dark the shape the shadow and all that lot and I found it was Artemisia Gentileschi and I had, I'd never heard of that name at all and I, I don't quite a lot of research into Renaissance and Baroque but her name had not really come up at all and then um, and then I found out she was a woman I thought my god a, a female painter in the Baroque in a Baroque style I thought I've got to investigate that so I investigated it I think it's far superior picture than the, Car- the actually Car- Caravaggio um, Judith beheading Holofernes And then I looked into a story and I got a couple of biographies and then I realised that not only had she painted um, rape, um, mythological paintings, but she'd also been raped herself. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting to see a woman's perspective of what rape can can look like. Now, she painted Susanna and the Elders before she was raped, which was back in um, 1610, I think she was only about 17, 18 when she painted it. Um, But the fear 
in Susanna's face in that painting. I'd never seen that either. I've not really seen that. You, do, you usually see women in well, smiling or in the throes of uh, passion or whatever. So I, look, I, I read the story, which is from the Bible, Book of Daniel, and it's not an actual rape, but it's a threat of a rape because she won't sleep, have sex with um, the two elders that are the same to her. Basically, if you don't have sex, we'll tell the village that you did have sex with us and you'll be stoned to death, basically. So she takes, she risks it and she um, she says, no, I'll take, I'll take my chances. The village don't believe her and they're just about to stone her to death when Daniel comes in and said, no, actually, I saw it all unfold. But it was the look on Susanna's face in this painting that I just thought, wow, that's, I've just never seen that before. And I, I think people think also back then that rape was just kind of a given, you know, that women just got raped. But if you look at that face, you can see that that fear in her face in that painting is no different than you would imagine a rape victim today. So, um, but that's how it all started. And then when I discovered that she had an exhibition at the National Gallery, so I thought, well, I'll go down and see that. I was also doing my master's at this time. Um, and then I saw all the other sort of paintings and she, she covered Lucretia and she covered Dane and these were all victims of rape. So uh, that's kind of how it started. Um, and then I just looked into, and I found out things like Ledger and Swan was rape. And I'd never, I had that postcard on my wall <laughs> as a teenager, well, because it's beautiful, you know. Oh, it's, it's stunning. And you sent, you sent us a really beautiful example of Michelangelo um, exploring yeah. the subject of Leda and the Swan, which is actually again at the National Gallery, and it's the first one that I looked at from from the list that you sent me. And when I saw it, I was like, "Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful." Her her figure, sort of reclining, her expression, her, so loving, so beautiful. And on uh, unless you really look closely, you have to go, "Oh, where's the Swan?" And and then and then you see what's happening, but. It wasn't until I looked at this that I, I realised at 31 years old, having 10 years of art history behind me, longer, that it was a rape. And I, Yeah, and she it, was married. She was married. She had a husband. Um, I'm trying to think what the husband was called. Um, Tynarius, Tynar I think. So she was a happily married woman. She was just by the river and Zeus wanted her, basically saw her. And I guess he thought he wasn't going to get her by being a man but he could seduce her by being a swan. So he came down and once she was, I think once she was petting him, he, he raped her yeah. and bore her children. Yeah, and it's so interesting because it's, you know, it's 2021. Everyone's far more switched on to things like the Me Too movement, the threat of violence against women that happen mm. all over the world every single day. And I wonder now that, I'm a bit more aware of what's happening as an older woman myself mm -hmm. that I I find the idea of in a lot of these uh, paintings that we're going to talk about it's very vulnerable situations where or where women are kind of caught off guard that it will just be oh, I'll transform myself into something sort of fluffy and cute and that will allow me to get close to my prey or even when you were talking yeah. about Susanna and the elders you know she's she's bathing it's a very off-guarded time. You don't you don't think that you have to be aware of your surroundings when no. you're doing something like that. It's a very intimate moment, personal moment in someone in someone's every day. Yeah, it's when a woman's on her own. These yeah. things happen. It's when she's, you know, and bear in mind, Zeus is, you know, a, a, a god with yeah. great strength, and he has to wait until the women are on it because he I mean, he didn't just rape women he wrote he raped men as well mm. but um um because he raped can you remember but he turned himself into an eagle and he he picked up this young boy because he wanted beautiful young boy and carried him off to, to his to his palace and yeah and raped him my first encounter with lady in this one was i i worked with an artist called george taylor and she creates canvases and images using feathers so she'd recreated the swan from Mm -hmm. this one and it was just so beautiful but I, I cannot believe I completely missed no it. it was because it she doesn't look like she is being attacked no. and and it's a subject that's been continuously revisited as well throughout our history and there's different stories 
about the children that she she bore she bore four children bore four children two yeah. eggs <laughs> yes well, <let's laughs> two human children but who and the one of the eggs was helen of troy of course who um so she was i think she was half mortal um helen of troy so that, yeah so it's almost like you forgive the rape because we've got helen of troy <laughs> Yeah, but this is a theme that, that rape being depicted within art history. So is it Nicholas Poussin? He has a, a painting called The Rape of the Sabine. And it's a Oh, the rape of the Sabine women. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and they're about I think it was three sisters, I think, and they were raped. And then they married their rapists. Yeah. But the whole idea I read, and I'll link this article and I'll, I'll send it to you as well, actually, after we've finished recording. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes below. And it's all about how art historians have almost justified the rape happening because it was yes because they marry they marry and, usually and the whole idea of why it happened was because the roman soldiers couldn't find wives within rome so they invited yeah being women in and then they just attacked them and took them as as their wives but it wasn't seen as as a travesty because these women were helping secure the future of rome so oh well there was a slight inconvenience absolutely but, hey it's just the women and it's it's really shocking that and it's a really hugely celebrated painting within art history it's one of one of the sort of the defining greats if you're looking yeah, for I think Rubens covered it as well didn't he I mean loads of people I mean rapes <laughs> Leder, well leader in the swan been covered by you know Rubens. I mean, there's um there's one by Bush. Is it Boucher? I never know if I say his name right. Boucher, Boucher, the French artist. Yeah. Boucher. Um, and it's it's porn. If you see the if you see the painting, her legs are sprayed and the swan's head is between her legs. Yes, and it's. Do you, you know the one I mean? I do. I do. I saw it earlier today, and it's so it's quite graphic in terms it's, of. I, it's almost porn. It's it's. Yeah. It's yeah, um, but even with Artemisia when she was raped, I mean the reason, uh, but she, her, her rapist offered to marry her, and that's why at first, mm. um, yeah, her, and but then it found out that he was already married, so mm. then it went to, then it went to the court. But uh, that's how rapes were forgiven. If you if you marry your rapist, the rape is forgiven, and that's and that uh, well that's when with the um, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, you know, they end up marrying their rapists yeah and artemisia had a really awful time because it was it was her mentor it was her father's friend yeah that raped her um she was working in his so uh, artemisia people that don't know um her father was a painter and she took up her father's craft and her father paired her with who he considered to be one of the finest painters that he knew to train and, and work in the studio and she was raped while under his employment and it ended up she took him to court, which was something. Mm -hmm. the she, one was she was yeah, tortured. She was tortured. Yeah. During during the court case to make sure she was telling the truth. I mean, she she even shouted. I mean, she even had a part of his foreskin um, in her under her nails. That's how much she fought him off. Oh my God. And um, and he was never punished. Yeah. I think he, he left. He left the, the uh, he left the vicinity for about a year and then came back. And it was absolutely fine. Was and it was Artemisia's name and reputation because she was at this mm -hmm. time 18, a fabulous painter. And even people questioned her ability as a woman to, to paint as well as what she could because well, yeah. at that time we're not allowed to, to study. Well, they mistake her father's painting. Well, but they'll say, well, I think her father probably helped her. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> in the painting. Possibly know what the anatomy possibly. of a man looks like. That just can't, you just can't get that. There's no way. Yeah. There's no, and even that again is. This, I mean, it's all recorded in court documents and things like that. It's it's so belittling of mm. a woman's voice and the valid, validity behind and within a woman's voice as well. And, and when it's what's difficult with these is there's something about the power of paint on a canvas mm -hmm. that these what are seen as heroic scenes are immortalized forever. And they're celebrated even today as, as, um, as we said, amazing examples of painting. But it's, it's difficult because it's, we're celebrating works that depict great yeah. suffering. And it's very strange. 
Well, when I, because I, 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 for my masters, um, um, I, I covered all, all these paintings, but originally, I mean, and I was asked the question, well, what do you want? Do you want people to take the paintings down? Is that what you're trying to say? I'm like, well, no, I don't want the paintings down, but I want us to learn from them, you know, be educated, maybe have in the museums, have a plaque saying, you know, not just the name of the painting, but maybe a little bit about it. Um, so that we're not, it's not camouflaged. I think there's a lot of camouflage going on yeah. um, within art history. Absolutely. And and I think, yeah, it's, it's happened, it, it was painted, we know better now, so let's learn from it and, and have a bit of a description on the wall, now that we know the truth. But that's it, and when you don't talk about something, you give it power. And that's, that's just it. Yeah. We're afraid to address anything you're giving it power and I would agree with you it's not take them down or say no. or can't you know this whole cancel culture take them down you know throw them on the big fire it doesn't nothing like that because they are still they are still works of art they're historically important they tell a story of a time of civilizations gone by it's a way a really important way of recording and telling stories it wasn't common that people could read and write like we're that most of us no. can today but people told stories and it helped people picture what these stories looked like and I, I just completely agree with you I think it, it needs to be addressed and not shared away from it's not an easy subject particularly in something when when these things are in like the National Gallery but there has to be a there has to be some acknowledgement and, and we don't just sweep it under the carpet because you're you're not addressing a problem and letting people know that we, we don't condone this sort of thing we understand what, what's here but X, Y, and Z, here's what happened. And I think museums fall short in that in a lot of ways. My friend works for a rural life museum, bit of a sort of different tangent here. And they talk about the sort of the heterosexual family setup of mum, dad, two kids, and what that looks like throughout the ages. And I've said to her previously, but why isn't there anything about, you know, gay couples or? Because yeah. um, they've been or, around forever. <laughs> forever. <laughs> I said, and how they lived it, because they lived a very different life to people who were born heterosexual. And they have a right to tell a story too. They had to live in hiding. They had to pretend they were flatmates. Sometimes they lived on two different floors of a house to like to mask, even just a plaque to say, this is a certain type of way that people live. But there's also, there's other ways of living. This isn't, we're not saying this is the, the picture perfect no. way to be. There's other things there's other it trickles down it mm. trickles down. I mean I when I was again when I was doing the my uh, dissertation for my master's on on this subject I originally wanted to see if the way um, art has and and literature and music has depict rape if that's trickled down to how we view it now that kind of camouflage and not talked about and let's use words like ravished and let's and seduced and you know, and has it had that trickling down effect? And that's, and we're sort of still paying the price now as women that because it's been, you know, literally painted into, you know, beautified, that it's not taken seriously. There's another painting that you sent me that Artemisia painted. And I'm going to potentially say that Danny. So that's, yeah. So, well, that story um, is so her, her father um, had Danny. She was born and he didn't have a son so there was no heirs so he went to an oracle and the oracle said you won't have any sons but your daughter will you'll have a daughter and she'll bear a son and that son will kill you so he put Danny so she was I mean she was betrayed twice really she, he put Danny in, into a tower and locked her up with I think just a skylight and um and no no sort of proper food no nourishment or anything just waiting for her to die basically and Zeus found out about this and he'd heard that she was a beautiful woman. And so they, again, they cover it up because they'll say um, uh, a sea of gold or a, and it, he basically ejaculated through <laughs> through the bars of this skylight and got her pregnant. Mm -hmm. And and she and she bore a son, Perseus, um, and later did actually kill his grandfather. So the prophecy was. Um, and he also went on to kill um, Medusa, yeah. but um, but yeah, uh, Zeus again, bad boy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we hadn't pressed record when we were talking about Medusa earlier, but Medusa also Medusa was a rape victim. Was a rape victim. 
Yeah, she was raped. The reason she it would turn into a gargoyle was because she was raped. That was her punishment, because she was raped on Pun sacred ground. She was basically raped on sacred ground um, by a sea god. It might have been Poseidon, actually. And, um, and her punishment by a woman, by, I think it was Athena, by Athena was to, she had to leave and made, and made that no man could look at her again. So, um, and so she was taken to an island and left with obviously she, she looked at someone that they would die and that was because she was literally because she was raped she was a virgin she was a good person she was a beautiful woman Medusa beautiful woman and made ugly because she was raped it's, it's difficult because these women are then immortalized as as the villains and and you don't they're not given a backstory that's that's I'm, I'm fairly certain there's going to be at least a handful of people that listen to this episode and, and go oh I didn't know Medusa was a rape victim or oh I didn't yeah think I'm sure it was I'm sure it was I'm sure it was Poseidon or Neptune I can never, I get my Roman gods and my Greek gods because they're, they're obviously the same they're oh, exactly the same but um but yeah it's trying to remember the Greek gods and the Roman gods because obviously Roman mythology was 700 years after Greek so but the same stories with a religious you know you make sure you wonder where Christianity came from because mm. obviously Greek mythology would be before Christianity and there's a lot of similarities <laughs> and was the was the Danny um de painting was that in the Artemisia in the National Gallery were you it at? was and yeah it's I can't I think they call it a red, shower of gold that's it shower of gold mm -hmm. some some artists depict its coins mm -hmm. and they have a maid sort of gathering the coins and it's basically sperm I mean let's get cut to it yeah. um and but what I like about Danae's, and you have to you have to sort of get them all together, all these different paintings of Danae. But if you look at the painting of Danae, she's looking away from the shower of gold and her knees are clenched mm -hmm. together. So she's, I think that's Artemisia's little, if you look at Artemisia's paintings of rape victims from Greek mythology, Roman mythology or the Bible, I think she puts a little take on it that she's, you know, they're not happy participants even if it's made out that they are and she painted that one when she was 19 so this was just after oh. the court case had had this is just after the yeah i mean did it make her a better painter but i mean oh, i don't know did she you know put all that rage into her artwork with a lot of anger but so much power and in, in her and i mean nobody deserves that to to suffer no. craft but what an amazing and amazing painter that she, that she is. I'm actually, I've got someone coming on in a few weeks to talk about Artemisia, just to have a, an episode oh. dedicated to her amazing. Well, amazing she was married story. off. Artemisia was married off after her father married her off right. and sent her away. Um, and again, he, mar he married her off to one of his, um, again, one of his uh, students. Yeah. And she went off and it wasn't a happy marriage, but I think he just wanted to get married off and... It makes me wonder whether it was to save his own reputation as much as hers. Yeah, I mean, and you read so many different things. I I had read that she'd always she'd been married off by her father, but it was because it was it was order to to get her out. To get her out, yeah. And because she was soiled. Yeah, she was yeah. soiled. I mean, who was going to marry her? Ugh. I mean, you read about it. It's almost like she was lucky that that this gentleman took her on after oh, yeah. what had happened to her. Lucky, yeah, I'm sure that's. <laughs> Um, unbelievable but an, an incredible an incredible painting but it's again it's something that it's so subtle in this one particularly with the sort of the golden when I first when I opened up and, and looked at, uh, at Danny I, I was like oh my, my screen's a little bit dirty what's happened here because I'd really really zoomed in yeah. and it took me a wee minute to realize oh no that's the sort of suggestive gold drops and, and again it's a subject that's been portrayed a hundred yeah. times over easy well so. they'll cover it up they'll say oh and this golden shower cane and then oh suddenly she was pregnant as if there's no connection to yeah. that golden shower yeah of course it's, well then you break it down and it's obvious what it what it the golden shower represents yeah because Zeus can't, couldn't get through I don't think you get through the bars I don't know <laughs> Yeah. So he just he just oh he just ejaculated through the bars, and that was yeah. <laughs> I mean, the poor curator that ever has to sort of try and and, and write a <laughs> a PC version of so this is what's happening. Da, 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 um, label at, at a museum show that would be interesting. 
Well, again, they'll say seduced by seduced by Zeus via a shower of gold. Yeah, and it kind of takes the I don't, masks. That's to, seduction. That. Yeah. yeah, well, that's it. That's it. Oh, she wanted it. So, yeah, it's. Yeah, she was on a bed. <laughs> yeah, you know, she, she, she was the asking clock. for it. Yeah. Unbelievable. No, I know. And, but again, it's, it's a theme with everything. And even going back to Susan and the Elders, it's almost like, oh, well, you, we found you. You're mm. obviously asking for it. You're naked here in this bathing pool. Yeah. You're kind of asking for it. It's, um, it just doesn't sit it doesn't sit well no. and and the longer that you and this is the thing it is everywhere and it's not just you know sort of bar, the baroque period we no. when we're emailing back and forth one of my favorite things to to tell people when when they say oh dega i love dega he is somebody that rape and the mm -hmm. sexual violence of women is a big big part of what dega does and i love dega's dancers i love them and my favourite, my favourite of Degas, I've got well, two, is one is called The Star, and I'm sure you'll know it, but it's this the young girl and she's dancing on the stage and you can just see there's a figure of a man in the wings. And now if you yeah. look at that, you, you just think, oh, they're, they're looking at, at this girl dancing. She's the star. It's her moment. They're having a great time. But actually what it's showing you is a gentleman deciding if he wants to sleep with her or not that night. Yeah because these dancers had that their dance teacher was essentially their madam and she would parade gentlemen behind the opera curtains to see this is them performing at their best and you can take them home tonight and it's it's a real theme with Degas throughout the whole the interior story. the interior is is called the rape as well I think in French yeah. it's called the rape yes which I completely forgot about until I, I started looking at things for this as well and and once you start looking, <laughs> you can't stop because it just it, it, it just leads. It is a wormhole. It is a wormhole. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. And and then you had said when we were, had a little bit of an email exchange from we um, sort of deciding dates and things you were talking about, you know, people don't think when, when you think of things like Romeo and Juliet, it leaks into oh. everything. You know, they were. Yeah, she was twelve or thirteen. I think she was twelve or thirteen, depending on where you were. But she was a young, young girl. And then you have Mary, yeah. which you have to be careful when you're talking about this. But she was about thirteen. And bearing in mind, if you look at um, images of Joseph, he's a bearded man. So not only was, you know, she yeah. twelve or thirteen when she was made pregnant. Very similar to Danae, if you think about it. If you think about Danae. And Mary, and and the um, and Mary, I can't remember what's called the famous painters where she's Gabriel comes down and the Annunciation, the Annunciation, very similar to Danae, you know, made pregnant by right. no touching, right. and yeah, and she was, I think, yeah, if you read about, it, she's about thirteen years old, so she's impregnated. Now, so is that consent? Mm. Can you know by today's we would say that a thirteen-year-old can't consent? Well, and. In the Bible, Mood does say that she's she's scared and she doesn't want to. And the Abel Gabriel says to her, "No, no, you have been chosen," and that's kind of him handing over. He hands over a lily, which is obviously the, the sort of symbol of, of peace and and fertility, oh. and that she she is pure enough and has been chosen by God. But there's, I mean, that is a whole other wormhole. Oh, you have to be very careful. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Again, Dene gave birth to Perseus, who went on to be a great man. So, you know, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, who went on obviously to be a great man. And, but uh, you got to, as I said, you've got to tread carefully. But it goes back to the, the, what we were discussing a bit earlier with the women in Sabine and the continuation of Rome, the Roman Empire. Oh, it was just the women that have been slightly inconvenienced, but they've helped yeah. continue um lines and generations going forward so actually that little blip doesn't really matter because look look, look at the great thing that, that came out well, listen, look at the good that came from it so let's just move on but even when you when you look at paintings of mary and statues she's so much older than she really was mm -hmm. she's a grown woman you know and you look at the size of you look at the size of jesus sitting on her lap in a lot of paintings and you think well actually if she was 12 or 13 she would <laughs> She'd been so much smaller. Yeah. Jesus would have been, you know, huge, 
a huge mm-hmm. baby. Paul Orego did Mary and Jesus. And as the story is, and if you want to check that out, and it really is a young girl holding a large infant on her lap. Paula Rego is an incredible artist. But she, I mean, she changed the, the whole laws of abortion through mm-hmm. art. So art can change the world. You know, people say, can I, it can. No, through her depictions oh of, of abortion, um, the laws were changed and abortion was made legal. Yeah. I think they even had those paintings in government buildings. And for anyone that hasn't seen the Paula Rego ab- abortion paintings, I mean, there's there's a lot of them and they're, they're not easy viewing. No. It's not like a lady in the swarm where it's very easily masked. No, you, you know what's going on. You know what's going on. It's uncomfortable. So and it, but it's it's reality. It's it's real, and it's mm-hmm. still happening today. There's there's women that have to go to these back alley clinics because they can't they can't yeah. afford to have a, a proper medical procedure or it's illegal. And it's again another another huge thing of these things are incredibly traumatic when they happen, yeah. and they stay with you. It's not it's not something that that you forget very easily. Um, we spoke about this before I had pressed record, but you had also sent me an example of one, and we, we talked about what I found the most interesting is that the titles do not let on to what you're looking at. You know, Lena no. Swan, Susanna and the Elders. Danae, it's just called Danae. And then you have The Rape of Europa, mm. which is an incredible, an incredible work by Titian. Beautiful. It's a beautiful painting. But even the title, I even myself, and I've seen this painting in books and I've read the title. And I because I suppose rape doesn't obviously what rape means today doesn't mean what it did back then. To rape and pillage wasn't, it was to do with theft of property, yes. which makes it interesting that rape is theft of property. And I well, I suppose it still counts today. It's a theft of some, you know. Definitely. you know a woman's property yeah. but um but the rate yeah well that story is um so europe europa was again on the on on this side of the i think she was on the beach playing with her friends zeus saw her said i you know i quite like the look of look of her i'm going to i know what i'll do i won't i won't be a man because obviously a man coming towards loads of women is going to scare them but i'll turn myself into a beautiful white bull and so he does and he's placid and they, they make little garlands for, for his head and all that lot. And Europa, as soon as Europa gets on his back, he jumps up and he runs off and takes her to Crete and rapes her. And she bears three children. So she not only leaves all her friends and family, but, you know, she's taken to a different country and raped. Yeah. And even in, in this one, she kind of just looks like she's almost fainting or that she's just holding on. Yeah. Because it, it, he's running across the water in this but once you know it's a rape once you once you you actually think right this is a a, a image of a rape I think you view the picture differently Mm. I think you look at her face and her expression you think actually that's not I don't think that is laughing or enjoying it that looks like terror to me Mm. I think she's got terror in her eyes you know her legs are up she's taken by surprise she's not expecting it and I think it's interesting if you look at the um the red silk material that's sort of in there it's almost I always think it looks a bit like a vagina mm, it's oh. almost like a what's to come that's so interesting I've never hold on I'm gonna have a look at it I'm gonna have I know this is it if you want to see, the symbolism in it all is is amazing and I think yeah. in the sea if I remember right this in the sea there's um it's like monster fish you can't really see it and you I think you have to go um onto the uh, if you go onto the museum where the where where it is which is the Isabella Stewart Garden they have a brilliant image of that and you can really go close up and you can see the monsters and again it's almost like well this is what's to come you know the sea isn't a friendly place it's monsters are going to take you yeah well that's it and it's kind of like she has she has no option but to hold on otherwise she'll fall into the ocean and and... fall off she has to hold on otherwise she'll she's dead anyway yeah dead Um, by the monsters and the fish what, yeah, what I wanted to say was what I find really interesting about this because it's it's an unbelievably famous painting now. Interesting that a woman bought it and she loved yeah. it. She lo- like Isabella Stewart Gardner loved this painting. And yeah. 
it was the only reason she bought it was because she was supposed to buy another very famous painting called Thomas Gainsborough's Blue Boy, which is actually coming. Oh yes, to, which is coming back to the UK for the first time yeah. since it was sold in America, and like early 90s. Well, there's talk actually with the blue boy that that's why boys are blue and girls are pink. They sort of, they trace that back. The gender colouring goes back, even though I think Gains Gainsborough did um, pink boy, uh, the boy in pink as well. But that painting somehow meant the boys were blue and girls were pink. Oh, I didn't know that. That's so interesting. But it's such a, oh, an amazing, an amazing. Oh, Gainsborough's lovely. Yeah. I love, yeah, I love Gainsborough. I love games. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Andrews. I yeah. love that picture. Oh my gosh, I love he's that. He's so picture. naughty. He's so naughty because you know you can see him because he didn't like them, did he? he fell, I think he fell out. I think they paid him or something like that. So if you look at, he's holding it and it looks like a ball sack in the bag. It's actually shaped as a ball sack and there's a donkey and it's all these little references to obviously what he thought of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Okay, and he didn't even finish it. That's the thing. I think the baby, I think she was pregnant and she was going to have a baby. I think he deliberately left that blank so that eventually a baby, but I think he fell out with them, but he just didn't finish it. The power of the artist. I mean, nowadays it would have just been like, you know, big sort of shaped glasses and a funny beard they would have drawn on it, but that's... <laughs> No, really subtle, subtle references. Subtle, intelligent references, yeah. like, here you go. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so funny, the things that are hidden in plain sight in art. Mm. And I think it's it's its biggest and greatest trick. Yeah. Um, but there's one of the works that, which you sent me, and I, I love, I love this sculpture so much. I am, so I, my love, my first love is sculpture. I love sculpture. Yeah this Apollo oh. and Daphne <laughs> oh my gosh it's just I'm um, it's just beautiful how can anybody be so skilled to craft marble and so prolific oh I mean gosh. even if you just in your lifetime just produce that sculpture you'd be happy with that oh my goodness more but than the fact that it just went on and on and on but I do what I do love about that sculpture is that you do you see the fear in her face and there's a tiny tear mm. so I think he's being true to the story okay and can you, tell, can you tell us just to give us a, a very quick run through so the story is if I'm if I can remember correctly is Apollo I think he made fun of um Eros's um bow and arrow so to punish him he he put one arrow one arrow at Apollo and one arrow at Daphne one one the arrow at Apollo was that he would love fall madly in love with Daphne and the one that was striked at Daphne she would hate Apollo so um so he he, he, he just chased her he chased her. he hunted her down um and so she I think she turned to her father and said I'm I, I, I can't cope turn me into a tree so <laughs> so her father turned her into a tree to escape Apollo's, because um, I think if he'd got hold, well, you can see in the sculpture, if you get hold of her, he's he's, he's going to rape her. Yeah. He's not going to take no for an answer in that in that sculpture. You can see it in her face, it's absolute fear. Yeah, and it's it's such an iconic story within um, mythology. But oh, it's, is... it's a beautiful story. I think yeah. the reason that laurel trees are, um, they don't shed their leaves, is the father made sure that his daughter would always remain beautiful and green. Evergreen. Beautiful green tree and, and evergreen. Then, did he not, did Apollo not completely fall in love with the tree then and he took the tree? I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, but again, it's an interesting... It's an, it's an interesting, did, yes, did he just stick by the tree? I don't think he did because yeah. I know that he went on to do other things. But... Hang about oh, the tree, they, yeah. It's almost, it's almost like um, like a, like a suicide, isn't it? Turn yourself into a tree to get away from your stalker. Yeah. Is to, is to kill yourself, stop living. And well, it's. I mean, when I was reading about it, it's called. Uh, it's one of the first depictions of unrequited love, and I was like, is it unrequited? I mean, no. it is unrequited love. <laughs> it's, no, it's not love. Very, very pushy. But this is it. Words like love and ravished, and as I get said, seduction. It's all. I think even now people people find it difficult to say the word rape. I don't think it's an easy word that no. slips off the tongue. I mean, and if you think of the words that are in circulation, like war and terror and torture, 
and paedophile and all that like we say those words quite easily but the to say rape even mm. women i think find it hard to say rape yeah. if you talk to rape victims they'll sort of go around you know and well you know he did this he did that but it's hard to say the word rape but well it's it's a it's a powerful word that and it has it's so a really powerful, powerful word how interesting that things like kill and murder i mean they're massively powerful words but you say those with ease yeah but there is there is something that's tricky with rape and even and even like when we were talking about doing this episode i was like what am i going to what will i call it what, what what how will i title the episode that so it's not going to offend people and it's probably the first episode that i've ever done where i'm going to have to put a little thing to say there's a there's a trigger warning here a little trigger warning absolutely well I had when I did my master's um dissertation um I called it there's a there was a lovely exhibition back in I think it was 2018 called the unheroic acts and it was in New York and it was all um art about rape and you had really famous people in there I think uh uh, Ono was in it um I can't remember her gosh I can't remember her name she 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 was murdered um Mendez Oh gosh, my memory goes. But anyway, it was a brilliant, fantastic big exhibition called The Unheroic Act, which references a book called The Unheroic Act, which is about rape. So that's what I call, because again, what do you call it? Yeah. What do you, do you use, again, using that title in a dissertation, I found tricky. So I, I called it The Unheroic Act myself. So um, and I actually got in touch with the curator and she was quite pleased for me to use that title. Right? So. And what was your your conclusions and in, in your thesis? But what were the kind of things that you that you were hoping to? Well, well, I'm an artist, so so um, with all these images, which you probably won't know, is that I transcribed all the images I've, I've told you about, and I did my version of them. But what I did is I went back in time and I saved the women. Oh, wow. So so if you look at my probably Instagram is probably the, the easiest way. But if you go back, I've I've actually done I've done eight all together but I, my first one was Manet's Olympia now you know Manet's Olympia yeah so I, I, tran- I transcribed that and I replaced Manet with myself and I, I called it Melody gives Manet uh, Melody gives Olympia and Laura the day off so the maid and Manet because she, she was a prostitute as you know she was a prostitute and she was waiting for a gentleman caller so I gave him the day off and I'm just sitting on this bed with a book fully clothed waiting for any <laughs> gentleman callers for me to just say not today love she's yeah. out <laughs> Love it. and then so so from there I went on so I um so Susanna and the Elders as an example I put uh, Melody Melody say uh, Melody fights the Elders and saves Susanna so in the image I've taken their walking sticks off them and I've beat them <laughs> and I'm bloody because we've had a fight you know I've, I've had a fight with two men and so I'm bloody and I've saved Susanna from the from you know the fact that she had to go through all that and with Danae um I I let her out of the tower and I'm actually holding Zeus's sperm in my hand, which is in the, in the form of Christmas, like yellow, yellow lights. So yeah, so I've transcribed all these rape scenes. I did Persephone as well, because Persephone is also a rape victim. And um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think what else I did. Yeah, Apollo, I've even done Apollo and Daphne. So I've, I've got a, a, an ax and I've actually chopped her out of the tree and released her. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Is this the ones where you're in a, not like a photo studio, you're in a photo studio. I'm a student and I kept, and I, a reason you can see everything, the background and everything, is because I wanted absolute, um, that you, there's nothing was hidden where it is in the other paintings. And that's why you can see the backdrop and you can see the rest of my studio and you can see the thing, the, even the little clips that are holding up the fabrics and you see everything. So there's absolutely um, transparency which I think isn't in history paintings. Well, that's it though. And that's that's the whole point of this conversation is to sort of unpick a little bit or like help people mm. look, really look at things. And I think that's something that that's just a big problem with people today. How often do you go into a gallery and you just... So I, I used to work for a, in a sculpture gallery and the amount of people that would just walk in and just fling your head in one direction, right, I've seen it, and then they're out again. Mm. Like, pick one thing and really look at it mm, give yourself definitely. It. and it's particularly when it's a story that you think you know and then I think baroque paintings do this beautifully there's a lot of symbolism there's a lot of hidden messages I think Hogarth is somebody um 
William Hogarth, British artist. Yeah. Somebody who does it really well as well. All these little... Oh, he's fantastic. Things. Oh, my goodness. He is the king of comedy, in my opinion. And I'm really excited because he's got... he's the, the Tate have just launched an exhibition of... Oh, have they? Yes. Oh, so I'm a fan of Hogarth. And, yes, yeah, so it's in Tate Britain. And it's running for quite a wee while. It's one until February now. Um... But yeah, could you send me your images that you did? And I, and I, I will. I was, was going to say that my favourite is the Rape of Europa. And I've actually got a bull's heart in my hand, a real bull's heart. And it's called uh, Melody Tears Out the Heart of Zeus and Saves Europa. And I've got a garland of flowers on my head as well. But I've actually yeah, got real proper bull's heart in my hand. <laughs> so they're quite, I mean, they're quite graphic. Like I said, the Susanna and the Elders, I mean... I'm wearing a crown in them as well. And the rapes that we've been talking about, yeah. It's... Now, all of all the, there's, um, I've covered eight rapes from, from art history, which and I'm just going to keep going because there's so many. Um, I want to do Medusa. That's my the next on my list, and I want to do um, uh, Philomena because Philomena is quite a brutal rape, and that's from Greek mythology. Oh, I don't, I don't know the. Oh, you know. Basically, uh, if I can remember the story, so. Um, she want, She sent her husband to go and get her sister um, to bring her back. And her, her husband went to her sister to, to collect her, to bring her back. And he raped her. And so that he so that she couldn't tell her, her sister, he cut her tongue out. And so um, when she came back, she had she, she could just embroider. She embroidered it into and told her sister that her husband had raped her. And to punish him, to punish her husband, she killed their only child um, as punishment. And then um, somehow, I can't remember this bit, but somehow they're all turned into blackbirds. Mm. And so there's lots of symbolism there. Okay. And I think the child was turned into a blackbird as well. And the, and the, two, and the two sisters were turned into blackbirds. But it's, yeah, it's quite, a, it's a brutal, I mean, you know, you talk about um, you know, what's going on in the world today and uh, what's on television and films and the brutality. It's nothing compared to what the Greeks came up with. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Greeks and Romans. And the Bible's brutal. Absolutely brutal. I think in um, Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, there's 50 rapes. Just 50 rapes in that book alone. Yeah, and um, the whole, and most of Titian's, so the, the Rape of Europa, that's part of a series called The Poesy. It was for, um, is and, it for Philip II? Yes, Philip II. Second. Yeah, yeah, Philip yeah. II. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and they've all been sort of split up and they came together for an exhibition last year um, yes. at the National Gallery. And then it's done a little bit of a tour. So it went to Edinburgh because two of the poesia so what I didn't know actually is two of the poesia are co-owned by the National Gallery in London and the National Gallery in Scotland and every two years they yes I've heard this they, they, yeah exchange what a brilliant idea yeah I, I think it's great I, I, the more people that can see these things the better I think it's really clever one is mm. in the welcome collection I don't know about one of them but the, then the other what other maybe it's five paintings I think it's six though and the and one is the, the last in the series is the Reaper of Europa and that ended up in Boston at the Isabella Stuart Gardner Museum um but they're doing up to so the come together for the first time at, since essentially they were painted. I got to see it I was lucky I was oh, one of the few who got to see the titian oh um, was no, so, was, so lucky. Was again <sighs> overwhelmed overwhelmed beautiful and I think I, I do think they're now in America doing a tour over there because right they, they, they were London Edinburgh Madrid at the Prado because that's where one of them is, is from and and then in Boston as well but going back just briefly going back to the titles I mean obviously artists didn't even a lot of you know the rape of Europa I don't think Tishri even called it that a lot of these mm -hmm. titles come later on I've, like Botticelli's um, Birth of Venus Botticelli uh, didn't call it that um, I think it was someone who's archiving it, just said, what can we call it? Oh, I don't know. We'll call it the birth of Venus. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that's what I found out was a lot of these titles um, weren't even, a lot of paintings were never given titles. Because we didn't do that. We didn't do that back then. You know, they were just paintings. True, that's true. Um, that's they're just true. depictions. But, um, gosh, I could go on. Because, you know, the, the birth of Venus, yeah. she's, she's become a, from a penis. The birth of Venus, yeah, um, that was Coronus cut off his father's genitals, threw it into the sea, and that's how Venus was born. 
No. I think it was Cronus. I think it was Cronus and cut off Uranus's penis, threw it into the sea, and that's why she's comes out of the sea because um, she's basically a penis. <laughs> What? that's a true story i'm not making that up oh my gosh that's amazing i might have to get you back on for all these <laughs> yeah, i'll tell you what I, greek mythology you don't need to read anything else <laughs> it's it's just fantastic i really need to brush up on it i really really yeah do. you check out Aphrod- aphrodite or venus depending roman or greek but um yeah she's she is of penis <laughs> wow oh my goodness oh i've loved it Melody thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about these five brilliant works I've, I've absolutely loved it so um where can people find you and engage with what you're um, doing right well I'm on I'm on Instagram and I'm under Melody Thornton artist because Melody Thornton is a pussycat doll oh well there you are <laughs> well there you are and um we know of each other believe it or not because we get confu- people get confused by us so I get fans following me thinking I'm a pussycat doll and I think people who have looked for my work have looked to her <laughs> um so we know of each other which is bizarre um I do exhibit um occasionally obviously because of um because of uh, covid not so much but I do exhibit I've got a studio in home Firth, which is always open to anybody who wants to come and have a look but yeah mainly mainly Instagram is where I would put my artwork if you wanted to find me fantastic yeah I do I'm a feminist artist so all my work has a definite feminist feminist um halo around it yeah it's always a message there that is amazing and um before I go I I don't know if you've listened to the, the podcast previously but I always ask people the same last question and it's a pretty big one so go on and so the question is, why is art important? Oh, because it brings joy, it educates. Um, gosh, it, it, in my darkest days, I just have to look at a, a piece of artwork or read a book about art. It's, it, I'd rather read about art than read fiction because the stories are there. I mean, everybody has art in the house. Everybody, even people who don't even think they're into art, they've got something in their house. They've got some picture on the wall or some ornament. It's all art. How can you not like art? Mm. It's for everybody. That's it. Oh, I love it. That is amazing. And I completely <laughs> agree with you, but it, th- this is the whole point. But everything is art. Toilets are art. I mean, someone That's had to design it. a toilet. That's someone it. had to design a car. Someone had to design a house, a radiator, a pair of scissors, you know, it's not always about function it's about the fact that why do you choose one pair of scissors over a different pair of scissors yeah. because one speaks to you more than the other yeah well that's it you know and clothing as well is, is, a, is a great way how people express themselves and uh, as an art form and yeah yeah it's what I always say, my sons don't they're very much of like well, what's the point of it and it's like what are you wearing what is it you know you do they cover you know that you've chosen there's a pattern on it why have you chosen it yeah. yeah absolutely oh I love that I've never really thought of that actually in terms of duvet covers because I do think duvet covers say a lot about yeah as well and, and you choose I think you, you're drawn to something that speaks to you yeah otherwise we'd all have just white duvets I <laughs> born happy. Duvet covers. <laughs> but you choose a pattern for a reason you choose wallpaper for a reason you choose the color of a car for a reason mm-hmm. you know it's infinite Melody thank you so much <laughs> have loved chatting to you so so much and um I'll send those images to you. I'll send them now to you. Yeah, I'm going to continue doing it. I want to get about 20 altogether. I've got, I've got um, yeah, eight, nine now. But yeah, I'll send them. Absolutely. Well. And there you have it, another episode of Joe's Art History Podcast. Once again, I'd like to thank Melody for coming on and speaking so brilliantly about a very sensitive subject within the history of art. This conversation to me and this podcast episode in general I think is one of my most important that I've put out. Art history for all its wonder and might also contains a lot of really dark hidden secrets but hidden in plain sight and it's my job as an art historian and what I want to do with this podcast is educate and shed light on these things as well. It's not meant to offend or upset anybody but it's another way of looking at art history and that art has always recorded and depicted 
moments from within time that are not easy viewing or watching or listening. If you'd like to get in touch, please feel free to do so. You can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram at joesarthistory. My DMs are always open. If you've enjoyed this episode or think of someone who might benefit from listening, please feel free to pass it on to them. As always, all the images that we discussed on this podcast can be viewed via my Instagram highlights reel. This is episode 46, so if you go along to the highlights reel and find the number 46, you'll find the images there, as well as Melody's own series, which she discussed in the podcast. This was a great conversation for me to listen back to. I really hope you've enjoyed it and that you've learned something, and just to look closer next time when you see some of these works. My name is Jo McLaughlin, your friendly art historian and host of Jo's Art History Podcast, and I look forward to welcoming you next time. Keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.